and we're getting ready for some serious turbo time here in the horsepower shop. Later today, we're going to try to shake the walls of that dyno cell with a small block beast that I predict makes 900 horsepower. Now, if you saw us last week, you know what I'm talking about. If not, don't sweat it. We brought back our old 92 LX Mule Pony as home for a new engine project. A 382 cubic inch small block, that all started with a world man of war cast iron block that we filled with a Clower Chrome Molly Forge crank, billet rods, forged aluminum pistons, and roller cam. On top, we bolted up some Trick Flow CNC machine race heads and went with Prower again for solid roller lifters, Chrome Molly push rods, and shaft mounted brockers. The intake manifold is a two piece setup from Trick Flow, and to feed it, an F90 throttle body from AccuFab plus 160 pound Bosch injectors. So with a compression ratio of eight and a half to one, this motor has been optimized for this. It's a turbo system that was put together for us by the guys at Hellion Power Systems. Now the heart of the system is this 88 millimeter Y2K Turbonetics Turbo. Now it features a three and a half inch F189 turbine wheel that uses a ceramic ball bearing technology they have a patent on. Now it comes in a mid-sized frame which will give us lightning fast spooling and it can produce up to 50 PSI. Now Joe may be getting a little conservative in his old age, but I think this setup is going to make well over 900 horsepower. We won't know till we get the motor loaded on the dyno cart so we can assemble a turbo line. These Bassani shorties have inch and 5A primaries and 2 inch collectors. They were recommended by the guys at Hellion. To keep our headers snug, we're using stage 8 header bolts along with the lock washer and the retaining clip. The small size of our headers are going to help make a lot of exhaust pressure to sufficiently spin the turbo. Now they're mounted backwards because the whole system is going to be mounted on the front of the engine. Now this pipe assembly here bolts to the headers and it's got a flange that's welded onto it for the turbo to mount to and also a place for the wastegate. Technically speaking, a turbo system is a positive feedback loop, which means, of course, that exhaust from the engine causes the turbo to spin. That forces more air into the intake of the engine, creating more exhaust, and that makes the turbo spin faster. Now, without some way to regulate that process, guess what? The engine blows up. Of course, that's where the wastegate comes in. Now, this RG45 is the latest from Turbonetics, and it's designed for trouble-free maintenance. Inside the investment steel housing is a floating valve seat that also serves as an inlet seal and well flange. Now, inside the wastegate right here is a spring like this that opens the diaphragm at a certain PSI level, and, well, we've got springs with different PSI ratings. Also, See the set screw here? You can turn it to adjust the preload to suit your needs. You'll see how that works in a minute. The wastegate needs to be mounted between the headers and the turbo. We'll just fit it up loosely for now. The turbo bolts up next on its flange using a crush gasket supplied in the kit. Then oil feed and drain fittings for the turbo housing. Now this air-to-air -air intercooler is custom fab by Spearco for Hellion and can handle a thousand plus horsepower. All right, with the piping loop completed, we're ready to install this Godzilla blow-off valve from Turbonetics. Now this thing has a 45 millimeter stainless steel valve assembly that offers us plenty of surge protection. Now what this means is as you come off the accelerator and the throttle body closes, the turbo is still making boost through the pressure side of the pipe. Now this valve allows that excess pressure to escape, so when you get back on the throttle, you don't have a bunch of turbo lag to worry about. Now we're ready to hook up the downpipe to the turbo, then the oil filter. Royal Purple's break-in oil is ideal for a new motor like this. Then we need to prime it, and you can pretty much tell when it's fully primed by the sound of the drill motor. With a coat of Loctite anti-seize, we're trying out a set of Denso Iridium Racing plugs. Okay, I got the bronze gear on this MSD Pro billet, and it's ready to go in. Now, you probably heard this before, but the cast iron gears that come on a lot of these distributors are fine for flat tavet cams. They're made from the same material, 
but that's not the case for the roller. Yeah, a roller is made of hardened steel which will destroy a cast gear. Now a couple of things happen. As it wears, it actually chips the material off of the teeth and that goes into the engine. Now once all the teeth are gone, you don't have anything to spin the oil pump. You lose oil pressure and the motor gets destroyed. So just make sure you use a composite or a bronze gear to avoid those problems. Good advice. Now after we get this thing clamped down, we can throw on these MSD plug wires and then show you how we control the fuel injection in a setup like this. Yeah, we're just a few steps away from firing up this turbo motor and making the most horsepower this dyno's ever seen. So make sure you stick with us. A thousand, huh? I think it'll do a little more. We'll see. Almost ready, Mike. Oh, I'm getting anxious. Hey, welcome back to the Horsepower Dyno Cell. We're just a step away from firing up our turbo stang motor and making the most horsepower our dyno has ever seen. Now, it doesn't matter how many pounds of boost you can make or how many cubic inches you have. The most important thing to making big power with a combination like this is a precise tune. So that makes the fuel injection controller the most important component. And for that, we got in touch with a company that's been putting theirs in some of the fastest heads up race cars in the country. Like the one Ken Rainwater uses in his turbocharged Outlaw Mustang, running the eighth mile at the four and a half second mark on alcohol. And now the same company, High Performance Controls, has a new version for gasoline, one that helped Shane Stack's Monte Carlo become a top competitor in the limited street class. We use uh, input from the engine, engine speed, manifold pressure, throttle position, and uh, we take those uh, uh, numbers and feed them into a, an algorithm and do a lot of calculations on it and decide how much fuel to put in. The heart of the system is this MFI controller box that mounts in the car to protect it from the elements. But here in the dyno cell, we're just going to mount it up on top of our workstation. In addition to several sensors, it has a connection for the main harness, a switch 12 volt source, and the ground. To speed up the process, we let Alan and his business partner Patrick Johnson handle the tuning process on their laptop. Now this is a painstaking process to get the precise air and fuel mix for the entire RPM band. We're making our pump gas pulls with 26 degrees of timing, and our RPM sweep will be from 2,500 to 6,000. Really nice, that's very nice. This is crazy, buddy. Check this out, a 93 octane off-the-shelf parts. We just made 988 horsepower, 939 foot-pounds of torque. That's amazing, absolutely amazing. And this is going in a street car. That's gonna be one heck of a ride. I can't wait to drive this. That's gonna be fun. Yeah, but we ain't done yet. A little more timing, a little more boost, and some of the C16 race fuel. 117 octane, by the way. Now, when we see four-digit horsepower, what do you think? To monitor the engine's boost, we had to get a transducer from DTS. We installed it in our red box. Now what the transducer does, it takes a pressure, converts it to a voltage so the dyno's computer can recognize it. Now Alan is gonna advance the timing on his laptop through the MSD box two degrees. And we'll adjust two more degrees using the distributor. 1,051 horsepower, 968 foot-pounds of torque. To adjust your boost, we have to adjust the spring pressure in the wastegate. Loosen up the jam nut, turn the set screw in small increments, then tighten your jam nut. In case you're wondering exactly what boost does in an engine, is it pressurizes the intake. So when the intake valve opens, you're forcing air and fuel into the cylinder, making a lot more compression and a lot more horsepower. In a normally aspirated motor, when the intake valve opens, the piston only sucks the air and fuel in. You're gonna have a lot less compression and a lot less horsepower. That's insane, 1,110 horsepower, 1,039 foot-pounds of torque, and that's in our dyno cell. If we had more cool air running over the intercooler, like out on the drag strip, this motor would have made more power. Plus, we're being really conservative. Once we get it in the car, we can add more boost, more timing, and more fuel, and our little Mustang's gonna run like a wild stallion. 
Well, hopefully we'll find out in a few weeks. I still can't get over the fact that this little small block made almost a thousand horsepower on pump gas with off the shelf parts that you can get out of a Summit catalog. Well, now I guess you're ready to see what this thing is gonna look like inside the Mustang and you will next week. But that's after we call in some favors from some of our power block pals to build up the roll cage, which wouldn't be safe with a motor like we got. Plus the inside of the car needs some tin work to fill in the rear area. Well, although we can't take our Mustang to the track today, we still can take in some heads up racing and we're gonna do it down in South Georgia right after the break. Holy cow, look what we found down in South Georgia. Out in the middle of nowhere, a modern cool circle track, and on the other side of the grandstands, a newly renovated drag strip. And, well, you know, with the economy the way it is, you gotta do what you can to pay expenses. We're about ready for the first burnout, though. Now, if you run in one of the true heads-up classes, well, like Outlaw 10-5, you better bring a high-priced hauler for your quarter-million-dollar race car, a lot of tools, and enough extra parts to stay in the race. Oh, and don't forget to bring enough bodies along to do all the work in the pits. Yeah, running with the big boys takes some pretty big bucks. Feature of the Orska Outlaws who race on a seriously low budget. The index racers. Bracket racing? No. Competitive and exciting? Or you be the judge. Okay, they've got three different classes in this Orska series with three different target ETs. Let's focus on the one in the middle, 6 0. We just call it an all out race, except you can't go 5.99. Yep, you gotta go for a six second, eight mile run without breaking out. Of course, there are double breakouts and this is where the lesser offender wins. Sound simple? Well, many of these 6-0 races are won by thousands of a second. A lot of the races are won right at the tree. If you can't lead with him, you can't outrun him. Mike Strickland loves the fact that he could build and run his Mustang for less than 25 grand and have a blast without breaking parts. I run it three years in the index class and never spent a dime on it. All I had to do is just routine maintenance. For a motor, Mike went with a 555 Chevy Big Block. Best way I've found is run it on motor and build enough motor to go faster than the index and back up to it. In addition to a good car, decent motor, and great reaction times, Part of the secret is the right tune-up for the track. When you get your tune-up, you've got to believe in it and run it out the back door and see what it does. When it doesn't give you enough to catch your opponent, well, there's always that bottle in the back. That's the bump around button. That's to catch up if you get behind. That's the emergency button. You might be out front right there at the end and you think, okay, I've got him. So you lift it a little bit and then he's got a button over here and he hits it on you and he goes right around you. Blaine Aldridge runs a clean, stock-looking Buick Grand National powered by a GM 572 big block. During Saturday's qualifying rounds, Blaine achieved an index racer's equivalent to a hole-in-one, a perfect 6 0 0, 0. We were too slow, and then we were too fast, and then finally on that run, just, you know, lucked up and hit it. So the crew got a hit today. So allow me to make two points here. First, race outings are supposed to be fun. Well, these crew members know that. And second, most middle-aged white guys look pretty silly trying to dance at a drag strip. But no dancing around the fact that winning is still the big deal no matter what class you're running. And we'll see them all run for the money and the glory of a championship when we come back.
back, and guess what? We're down to two cars in all of the seven classes of this outlaw shootout in South Georgia. Let's see what happens. Kenny Ford, driving a Chevy Camaro, we'll figure that, beat Terry McClendon in the 7-0 class. James Williams grabbed his first 6-0 win of the year with a 6-0-2-3 while his opponent broke out. Larry Peavy, another first-time winner in 5-0, running a 5-0-1-0. In Modified Street, Brian Murphy set a record in qualifying and brought home a win with a 5.42. In Easy Street, Steve Jackson made it three in a row even after an unexpected switch from a blown motor to a nitrous setup. Blew the Procharger motor up, just like we do just about every motor. Thursday night, we put the nitrous motor in this thing and made a hit, didn't get down track. Wheel stood, wheel stood all night Friday night. First round of qualifying is the first time it went down the track. So. The, uh, we normally can get down the track pretty good. So, so you're going to keep this combination for a long time? I don't know. We were just arguing about it. We don't know. What, we're thinking about building a turbo. <laughs> Here's the closest race of the day in Limited Street. Keith Sabo beating Shane Stack by three thousandths of a second. Outlaw 10-5 winner Tim Lynch just maybe thinking of breaking his own record of 434 sometime this year. I think we're going to need some cooler air. It was a little hot this weekend, but I think I think we can do it later on in the year, definitely. Maybe some 20s in the forecast. Man, with an engine like he's got, Tim can easily get in the 420s. Now, if you're looking for an affordable engine for your daily driver, check out these new Pace Pack Chevy 350s. Now, these completely new engines are rated at 290 horsepower, come with four bolt mains, and a two year, 24,000 mile warranty. Now, fully dressed versions come in either black, chrome or gray for just over 3600 bucks and that includes the shipping. Now if you're looking to repower an older vehicle but keep it stock looking, Pace Performance also offers this version for just over three grand. Hey, there's a good radio station. If you're going retro with your street rod or muscle car, you gotta go all the way, including the radio. This USA 630 is the latest from Custom Auto Sound, and it features all the things you'd want in a modern radio, like USB port for your MP3 player and inputs for anything else you want to add. Up front, you got complete control over the CD, your iPod, you name it. Now, they custom modify each one of these to fit specific vehicles. This one goes in a 55 Chevy. How much money? Well, how does 230 sound? I've been using ARP bolts ever since I started building engines. Now there's a way to order a long-term supply and keep them in a handy, good-looking place. Now their cabinets come with four drawers, fully loaded and organized, with a diagram under each lid so you quickly can find what you need. ARP offers four different versions of this. Ours came with 12-point bolts, ranging from a quarter inch to 7 sixteenths. For more information on us, go to PowerBlockTV.com. Well, that does it this week at Horsepower. I hope to see you next week.